I bet there is an application or service you have in your production environment that needs to be highly available. Besides, it's not so effective to run this application from the cloud because it consumes a lot of CPU and RAM resources. It needs to reside on-premises. For such a case, you need to build a highly available cluster that will allow this application to run smoothly and migrate to the partner server automatically whenever something bad happens with the server it was on before. And, the most important, there will be no data loss from an application. There are three main groups of components required. The hardware, where everything will be installed. The hypervisor of choice that will run a VM with your application and a shared storage between the servers. It will allow your application have real-time copy of its data on every server, giving the ability to change the compute resources anytime, while keeping the same data on both sides. Let's discuss all these three main groups of components required. We will start with the hardware. The main principle I would recommend you to follow when building a server infrastructure provision infrastructure according to the task solved. It makes sense to analyze your current infrastructure resource utilization and specify the servers to have 20-30% more compute resources. Of course, if there will be no dramatic production environment growth in the future. Why to do so? It is simple. Over-provisioning kills the return of investment. You just need two physical servers, ideally with an identical configuration, to make sure there will be no performance bottlenecks. In general, these days all infrastructure can be packed into a two-node footprint, simply because modern CPUs allow it to do so, alongside with the latest chassis scaling capabilities. The discussed architecture is hyperconverged. We would have both compute and storage resources mirrored between our servers. It also makes sense to keep this architecture as minimalistic as possible. We don't need any external hardware or software components such as storage switching, witness, etc. So we will just use a dedicated network card in each server, connect it between the servers via just a pair of direct attached cables while eliminating any extra points of possible failure. Such configuration improves the cluster performance by lowering the network latency between the servers. It makes sense using minimal CPU socket count due to power consumption and so the related electricity costs. We'll use either single socket or dual socket systems. It also recommended to gather the main storage of the servers into RAID array using hardware RAID controllers. RAID 10 for hard disk drives, at least RAID 5 for solid state drives. Now, when the hardware is in place, we need to choose the hypervisor. A hypervisor is a software that creates and runs virtual machines. Let's choose the VMware vSphere for now as the most major commercial hypervisor these days. And there is an important functionality we need to have when choosing the hypervisor license. To allow our applications to migrate between the servers automatically and without powering up, we will still need vSphere vMotion and vSphere high availability features that are present starting from VMware Essentials Plus license and above. Alongside that, we will need an orchestration tool for VMware ESXi hypervisor, the vCenter server. The standard version is enough. Now the shared storage. We will not use the VMware vSAN, the native VMware component that provides shared storage and can be purchased additionally, because it is expensive and is usually an overkill for smaller deployments. There is also no single reason to look at vSAN remote office branch office license, since it is too restricted in cluster functionality and there is no way to upgrade this license whenever you require some features that are missing in RoboLitense. Instead, we will use Starwind Virtual SAN as a significantly more resource-efficient option. Well, cannot prove that, but you are welcome to try out. It is deployed as the virtual appliance on top of each VMware server, providing the hypervisor with highly available shared storage. Now, when we have pointed out all the required resources, 
Let's get started with turning our stuff into a full-blown, highly available cluster in these five easy to perform steps. Step 1. Double check the system meets the cluster requirements. Let's suppose our desired application utilizes 30 gigs of RAM and requires 1 terabyte of storage capacity. In this case, each of two servers needs to have a single CPU capable of running this application at ease and if there are multiple VMs, I'd recommend having dual CPU setup to have better overall performance. 64 gigs of RAM, assuming we will need some additional RAM resources for running hypervisor and Starwind software. Two separate dual port network cards. At least one port from the first network card is used for connecting our service to core network. You can see it as management on the diagram. Two ports from the other dual port network cards will be used for data synchronization and SCSI connections. I'm going to connect the second network card in each server between the servers using direct attached cables. The network topology looks like on the diagram. One port from the first network card in each host is connected to core switch. The second network card is connected between the host port to port running through different subnets. The storage in each of our hosts is gathered in hard rate 5 array since we are using SSDs for our configuration. For SSDs I would also recommend having at least 10 gigabit networks to fully utilize the storage performance. Our recommended settings for hard rate are write policy write through or write back, depending on configuration, read policy, no read ahead, stripe size 64. Now when the hardware is set, the next step. Step 2. To be able to run virtual machines on our hardware, you need to install a hypervisor. Our choice today will be VMware E6. I prepared some prerequisites for this guide, so I already have E6i installed alongside with VMware vCenter which will be our main interface afterwards. I have installed vCenter as a local virtual machine to E6 host one. I have also configured network interfaces on each node according to the shown network diagram. All our next actions should be applied to each E6 server. I have created two standard vis features for Starwind related networks, the SCSI and synchronization ones. I've created VM kernel ports for the SCSI and synchronization channels. As well, I've added virtual machine port groups on the vSwitch for iSCSI traffic, the vSwitch 1, and on the vSwitch for synchronization traffic, the vSwitch 2. Finally, I've deployed virtual machines containing Starwind installation inside from OVF templates. You can get them in our official installation and configuration guide on our website. There should be one VM per physical host. It is important that these VMs stay local on their hosts. You should also avoid snapshotting of these VMs. Step 3. Let's pre-configure Starwind storage controllers. Log into storage controller number 1, log in using default credentials, and do not forget to set your own password. Here in the networking tab, the management IP address of the Starwind vSAN virtual machine as well as the IP addresses for iSCSI and synchronization networks can be configured. In case if network interface is inactive, click on the interface, turn it on, and set it to connect automatically. Set the IP addresses of the networks. Do not forget that iSCSI and synchronization networks need to reside in different subnets. I also recommend you set MTU to 9000 on interfaces dedicated for iSCSI and synchronization traffic. That will increase the overall performance of the solution. Change automatic to 9000 if required. Now we need Starwind Management Console. Currently it can be deployed on a workstation with Windows operating system. We will add the center plugin in the future so you will not need Windows operating system to perform this step. Open the Starwind Management Console and click Add Server. Type the IP address of the Starwind Virtual SAN in the pop-up window. Then click OK. Now we need to connect the first server and apply the license key. So I've already have the license key on this configuration. 
So I'm just going to use that. So we have first server configured. Adding the second server. Again, type the IP address of the second Starwind virtual machine. Now connect to this VM and apply the key as well. So the same steps. We have that on desktop. Accepting the agreements. Applying the license. Step 4. Storage time. Let's start from adding a new virtual disk to the Starwind Virtual Sand VM. Just right click the VM, click Edit Settings, click Add New Standard Disk, specify its size needed, make sure the disk is thick provisioned acre zeroed, and choose the proper location for the for the disk. The virtual disk should be on data store provided by the hardware rate, but that is not mandatory. Alternatively, the disk can be added to Starwind vSAN VM as RDM, raw device mapping. Now log in to the Starwind storage controller VM web console and find in the storage section under the drives over here on the right the newly added disk. So the added disk does not have any partitions or file system. Just click on the format button, choose the XFS partition, name the device, and select the custom mount point. Click for on the storage page of the disk, navigate to the file system tab and just click the mount button. Repeat the same steps on another host. Now let's switch to the Starwind Management Console. Connect to the first host and click Add Device Advanced button and open Add Device Advanced Wizard. Select Hard Disk Device as the type of the device to be created. Select the virtual disk, specify a virtual disk name, its location, and the size of the disk. Use 4096 sector size for targets connected on Windows based systems and 512 byte sector size for the targets connected on Linux based systems. There are some Starwind caching options available, but we will go with clear device here. Specify the target parameters. Select the target name checkbox to enter a custom name. Otherwise, the name is generated automatically in accordance with the specified target allies. Click Next and click Create the image file. Now we do have Starwind image file on host number one. For this deployment, we will use Synchronous 2A replication mode. It ensures real-time synchronization and load balancing of data between two or three cluster nodes. So right-click the recently created device and select Replication Manager from the shortcut menu. Select the Add Replica button and choose the synchronous two-way replication. So the two-way replication ensures real-time synchronization and load balancing of data between two or three hosts. Specify the host name or IP address of the second host. Choose the proper failover strategy. There are two of them. The first one, heartbeat, allows avoiding the split brain scenario when the HA cluster nodes are enabled to synchronize, but continue to accept write commands from the initiators independent. 
It is used when there are several physically separate network interfaces configured between Starwind nodes. If, for example, only one physical cable is present between Starwind nodes, you can use node majority flow strategy. It will require a third server or VM with witness functionality. To configure node majority, please refer to Starwind installation and configuration guide on our official website. So let's go with Heartbeat here. Create new partner device. Select the location of partner device on the second host. Choose the proper synchronization journal setup. You can use either RAM-based journal or the disk-based journal. Choose the network options for replication. Press Change Network Settings button. For the management network, we choose Heartbeat. For the SCSI network, we choose Heartbeat as well. And for the synchronization network, we choose synchronization and heartbeat. It goes with heartbeat by default on this network. Click next and choose the proper option. If you have a new device created from the scratch, you can choose do not synchronize button. If you have the existing device and you're creating replica of an existing device on, on the node one, choose the synchronize from existing device option. Click create replica button and close the wizard. Close the replication manager. And now we can see the second Starwind device being created on the second Starwind host. Step 5. Now we need to present the storage back to vSphere. Connect to the previously created devices to the ESXi hosts. Click on the storage, adapters, configure iSCSI and choose the Enabled option to enable software iSCSI storage adapter. Under the Dynamic Targets, click Add Dynamic Targets and add both iSCSI IP addresses from both of the Starwind hosts. Save the configuration. Now under the Devices tab, we can see that there is a Starwind iSCSI disk appeared. Repeat all the steps from this section on the other ESXi hosts specifying the corresponding IP addresses for the iSCSI subnet. Now open the storage tab on one of your hosts, go to the data stores and just create a new data store. Choose the Starwind iSCSI disk as the source of the data store. Choose the size of the data store. And finish the data store creation. Now whenever the server is rebooted, you would need to rescan the storage so the vSphere can see it again. But thanks to Starwind, we have an automatic storage rescan script that allows us to avoid this manual step. So you can find it in our complete installation and configuration guide on the website. All is left to do is just to create a data center within the vCenter management interface. Now by completing these five easy to perform steps, you can be sure your application will work continuously.